Well, hello, hello. I am so excited, you guys, because today I've got somebody super, super special. One of my dear girlfriends, Miss Cody Sanchez. <laughs> What's going on? Stoked to be here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Brave Table, girl. It's, it has, it's a beautiful table. It is, right? And we're going to just brave into all things today. Um, but I feel like for the audience, I think it's really good to set context about how we kind of met. Oh my gosh. This is so funny. I mean, it's been years now, five years. Yeah. So maybe like six. Five or six. I think it's six. Yeah. yeah it was six years. Six years. And look, you all will appreciate this as you followed this wild lady. Um, but <laughs> wild I, journey. yes, exactly. <laughs> I, uh, showed up to a cruise mm -hmm. in Miami. Random cruise. Summit. Yeah. Yes. Summit. Mm -hmm. And my girlfriend couldn't come. And, um, and so had I had you did, known about like summit. No, I didn't. Did. I, I just said, yes. You know, he's something sometimes do that in life. Okay. I was like, yeah, sure. Stay. So I'm going to go. And then all of a sudden she couldn't come. So I got put into a room yeah. with you and Catherine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also Catherine's a great friend of mine. Shout out Catherine. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I, first of all, I really, you know, don't room with strangers often in like a <laughs> tiny little bunk in a cruise. Okay. Can we talk about how small that room was? Smaller than that. I mean, it was like, we were basically, we were like I mean, snuggling the whole time. We were snuggling, especially <laughs> girls with all of our suitcases. It was crazy. Yeah. And you were traveling the world at the time for your book. And I was yeah. heavily in finance. And oh yeah, so, you were so in finance. I was very in finance. And so this yeah. whole summit thing with all these crazy woo-woo things and drum <laughs> circles and crying <laughs> circles. And I thought it was the weirdest Sound thing. Sound bad. Yes. All, yeah, and yeah, all yeah. of that's normalized now, but right. back then less so and definitely for me. In like, your world. Yeah. You were like super polished. Might as well have shown up in like a pencil skirt and suit. Like <laughs> so silly. Different, different from now. Very but, different. So we meet and it's an incredible experience. We have amazing conversations. Um, but at the time I was privately, hadn't told anybody in the world thinking about a, getting a divorce. Mm. And um, it was super hard for me. Lots of shame and guilt about it. Right. And I never told you. You and never told me. We yeah. talked about everything else besides and then at the end, you, you know, I think you probably said something like, I think this is going to be a really big year for you. I'm really excited for you. Yeah. And, um, and then I think you asked me, you're like, what's going on, you know, this mm -hmm. year? Are you, are you going through something? And I was kind of like, bitch, get out of my head. Like, you know, it's <laughs> not your business, you know? Like, I totally creeped. <laughs> yeah. And, but you, because we were complete strangers, but we had spent the weekend together. Right. And yeah. and I was like, you know, I think you know, there's some personal stuff I have to take care of. I don't even think I told you. No, you didn't. And you wrote in a book that I still have to this day, your mm. first book, book. First book. Yeah. yeah. It was emotional grit. Yeah. It was, it, yes. It was, it was grit. And you wrote, like, you know, a really nice note and then, like, I know you're going through something. I feel like it's a divorce. Mm. And if that's true, like I'm here for you and maybe this book would help and maybe not no pressure and whatever. And I ended up reading that book and I was like, damn it. You know, <laughs> she's right. And I got to figure some stuff out this year. And then that year was a pivotal year for me and everything kind of changed from there, cool. which is wild. Right. Yeah. I know. So you powerful lady. I mean, I mean, well, it's crazy because I feel like for those of you, like, you know, whoever has been through a divorce or whoever has been through like a reckoning with themselves. Yes. And I felt that energy with you. And I mean, like I had like sided with my girlfriend, Catherine, who's also been through a divorce. Right. And I was like, she's going through something girl. Like, <laughs> I'm like, she's going through like, and, like you could just feel it because yeah. you're just kind of like testing the waters and everything. And then, so <clears throat> it's not like I was psychic. I mean, maybe I was like following my intuition, but yeah. I mean, you just, you just know, and another female kind of knows. So totally. I'm glad I could be there, you know, to kind of unleash you and your badass. Well, and I think that book is really powerful because it's mm. not oh, intimidating you. to read. Mm. And so, you know, I started leafing through it a little bit and You're like, I what is this woo woo shit? Yeah, exactly. I'm like, there's no <laughs> spreadsheets in here. Like, what? This doesn't seem rational. How's this going to be ROI for my right, life? <laughs> exactly. Do I have time for this? And then I was like jetting off to Latam to run my asset management business at the time. But I read that book. And it had a really big impact. And that's when I started believing like the, you know, Dharma Institute and everything that you guys are doing now, there is this step before you get to any of the stuff that I talk about, which is the spreadsheets and tactics and ROI and money mm -hmm. that if you don't get your mind right, and if you don't get, you know, your physicality right and your mental state, you really can't execute on all the rest. Right. So I think it makes a ton of sense that people like come to you and they really sit in all of that mm. and then they're able to do the tactics. But they got to start with that. You right. Know? I mean, their mindset. I mean, that's what it what it originally and, and totally begins with. So I want to dive in. 
we'll do that. <laughs> so I want to dive in because you left this pretty like traditional marriage. Yeah. You were living in Dallas at the time. Yeah. And what I loved about you was you were so badass, like asset management company, like Latina, just full force. How was it, and you still kind of are, so I have a two-part question. How was it leaving this traditional, like fully traditional conventional marriage? A white picket fence, you had a home, you had all the things. Yeah, I think we actually had a white picket fence. <laughs> I think we did. Like two cars, country club membership, the whole nine. Um, Shout out Dallas. Yeah, it was very Dallas. I was actually with one of my friends just uh, earlier today talking about that time. And, um, mm. you know, I, I think it, it was incredibly difficult. I mean, my mom... It was harder. I think the divorce was like harder for my mom than it was for me. It's harder for the parents. It's yeah. Like you yeah. crushed their dreams. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think they also don't have to live in your existence. So she had no idea what I was going through, you know, mm. and, um, you know, it was different than your marriage. Uh, but there was some part of it that was emotionally abusive, at least in my eyes, mm -hmm. you know, that was, um, pretty toxic. Right. Yeah. And so that, um, was a huge burden off my shoulders, but I would say the ramp up to it was the hardest part. It was like yeah. so hard to get there. Mm. And even though I could be such a quote unquote badass and all this other stuff, being in the marriage was part of my identity and I didn't know how to let go of it. Mm. And I felt like I was failing and there was massive shame and guilt around it. And for a while, you know, my goals were like, just get divorced, like mm. just move through that. And then we'll figure out all the rest. So it was really, really difficult. And then I lost all my friends basically yeah. because they were our friends. Country club friends. Country club friends. Mm -hmm. Everybody else, you know, kind of chose the husbands, which I totally get. And so they went together. I, I was with a few friends that I still have to this day. Um, but, and then it was not only did I get divorced from this guy, but we worked together at the same firm. No, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh my God. And so for a while I had to see him all mm -hmm. the time. And so that was terrible. So I obviously had to leave not only my marriage, but my identity. And I think that's common. Yeah. I think it's same with you, right? Oh yeah. I had to leave everybody, everybody that I knew, everybody that it was a different world for me. I mean, it was the same kind of, you know, you kind of just, we, we have similar paths. It was yeah. like the country club in the city, you know, the first class travel, like all of those things. And you're just kind of going on this path to like rediscover who you are. Yeah. And you realize like, oh yeah, bottle service on the weekends. Uh, I don't really want to do that anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, like I want to go deep. Exactly. And I mean, because I couldn't find people at that level, I had to start like um, what we would call today a mastermind. Exactly. But I started that to get more friends who would be on like my terms, you know? Totally. And I feel like that, that's, I saw that similar thing kind of starting to happen with you. I'm like, oh yeah, I know where she's going. It was the exact same thing. Well, and also then my career didn't fit me. Yep. So my identity was wrong with my partner, with my career, with my friends, with my geography. How wild. And it's scary to change all those things at once. But I think what it leads to is, gosh, if we can get more people earlier to ask themselves, who are you? Who do you want to be? Why are you here? What's important to you? Then we can skip, you know, 10 years of you trying to be let somebody else be the architect of your life. And instead you can take the reins. So true. And being the controller, you know, you kind of get in that driver's seat. Right. Ooh. Okay. So this is a segue to my next question though, because <laughs> in the professional world, you are like this queen badass and now you've shifted gears. I feel like many times because you started the first ever cannabis fund. Mm -hmm. Tell me if I'm talking about the right thing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Where there's a no females doing yeah. funds and you, of course, badass as you are, yeah. go into the cannabis world and start a fund around it. And then now starting this new venture, which I absolutely love helping people with passive income. Yeah. And the, I love the tagline, yeah. <laughs> but we'll get into that in a second. Yeah. How does it feel to be in a male dominated industry? Well, it's all I've really known. Honestly, I started out as a conflict journalist, like um, human trafficking along the U.S.-Mexico border, writing these stories about... Okay, I did not know that. Yeah. Um, that's what I was. I did that in college. Um, and uh, so I've always been a writer. I've always been a storyteller. That was important to me. Mm -hmm. um, but then I went and did the thing that I thought I was supposed to do, right? Like, go make money, be traditional, white picket fence. And that's where I got on the wrong path. But um, honestly, I'm kind of a wuss. Uh, I'm like, I really try to minimize my risk. Mm -hmm. So what I did when I quit 
the big Latin American finance firm that I ran and built in Latin America is I took like a little baby step Mm -hmm. and instead, you know, and that's when I went and said, okay, well, I'm going to leave this type of finance, but I'm going to go to private equity and cannabis. And so it'll be kind of cooler, like still sexy. Yeah. It's still sexy. But, and like, I'm still in finance. So it's like, okay. Right. But I wasn't fully stepping into the thing that I knew I wanted to do, which was stand on my own two feet. I built that with a couple other partners. Okay. I joined a group and it was still too financy. Mm. It was still not quite there, but I needed like that interim step. Mm -hmm. So we raised a bunch of money, a couple hundred million bucks. Deployed it. No big deal. You know, no big deal. No big deal, guys. <laughs> and gals. <laughs> okay. So we kind of kept on the same path. And then um, and then the same thing sort of started happening. I was like, wait a second, this isn't quite right. So I moved to the board and I was like, I'm gonna oversee this and you know, I'll I'll be a part of it still, but you know, I actually want to do my own thing. I don't want any bosses. Mm. I don't want any like partners that I'm responsible to. I want it to be full investors me. that you're responsible to. Exactly. Yeah. I'm just going to invest my own money. Mm. And I've done that for 13 years anyway. And why can't I go do the thing that I want to do, which is I don't want to get rich quietly, which is what you do in private equity. I like getting rich together. Like mm. let's all do that together. So mm. then I said, well, I started off as a journalist. Why don't we keep sharing stories, do it about the things that I know. And that's kind of how we got here. Oh my God. Wild, <clears throat> wild, wild, because now your project is, I, which I love the title, Contrarian Thinking. And it's so unconventional of you in every way, because you're kind of like, I, I see you as this like paving the brave frontier. Mm-hmm. And now you're like, well, I'm going to own it. And you're owning it. Mm-hmm. I invest in boring businesses. Yeah. Can you tell us about that? Yeah. Well, Contrarian Thinking started, I think for a lot of people, during the pandemic, you had more time, time to think. I wasn't traveling nonstop with the cannabis uh, fund like I was before, raising money, keeping myself busy, not really being able to talk or listen to that little voice inside, right? Like right. going, going, going. So I calmed down and I was like, I got some time. I'm one of those people that thinks by writing. Mm. I don't think by speaking. And so I, I was Yeah, like, your writing is epic. Oh, thanks. I mean, seriously. Oh, thank girl. you. I what? feel like you're like in my ear, <laughs> like a girlfriend. <laughs> if you haven't signed up for her newsletter, it's, it's, it's so different and it's just... Writing is like so on key, but thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's got like a little, it's got my personality in it. Hopefully it's got an edge. Yeah. And so, uh, I started writing because I wanted to think more and then I felt like this wasn't happening. Like we weren't able to communicate. We weren't able to have conversations and I wanted to ask some big questions of people. And so contrarian thinking got started with two ideas. We need to be able to think critically. And in my mind, we need financial freedom because without financial freedom, we can't think critically because we have all these other things. It's why we probably got married. It's why probably we went into professions that we shouldn't have. Right. Because we felt like we've got to do what we need to do. We need to earn money. We need to establish ourselves. Immigrant families. Be safe. Be safe. Yes. Exactly. Be safe. Yes. And, um, I mean, shout out to those who really love the conventional and the traditional. Right. Awesome. Right. But let's it embrace. It for us. Yeah. Yeah. Let's embrace the brown well, sheep. and whatever. Maybe we're maybe work traditional or conventional today. It just wasn't the right path for us. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. But, um, so I started contrarian thinking because first I wanted to have conversations. Mm. Then I wanted to talk about money in a way that wasn't intimidating. Mm. Like it was for me in the beginning. And well, I thought, you broke it down. Yeah. And like, it doesn't need to be a bunch of like people in suits all uptight, Ugh, yeah. you know, trying to make this seem more difficult than it's not. We're literally, you know, you're a doctor. We're, we're not curing anything. You right. know, we're talking right. about numbers and zeros. It's not that difficult. Mm. And so that's why I started it. And then I invest in boring businesses now. And I start talking about it that way because it's just simple. Mm-hmm. Like if I tell you guys, I do private equity and M and A and, you know, yeah, pref you're equity, lose, yeah, you're going to lose this. No, that's actually boring and hard to understand. But right. if I say I invest in, we're right now recording this, like uh, a video company, a video production company, or I invest in a landscaping company or I invest in a cleaning company. You're like, Oh, well, I know what they do mm-hmm. and I know what it means to invest. I can combine the two. And so mm-hmm. now I talk a lot about that. I mean, so much so that like, I love when I do research on friends because so much so that you have a half a million followers on TikTok. <laughs> That's <been laughs> like, wild. Oh, okay. So take us through that journey. Yeah. TikTok's a weird place. Um, <laughs> I know I told my team because now we have a little bit of a media business and I'm like one rule, no dancing. There will be no dancing on oh, TikTok. Come on. I will not do come it. On. You're gonna do you gotta do the trends. No, you gotta do it. No dancing. So if you guys go there Latina, for the dancing, hello. I know. it's not happening. Oh, um this is literally no no dancing. But um but I started TikTok basically because the team talked me into it. But my original thought was um if my goal is really that I want to help people kind of get rich together, I gotta go where the people are. 
And my newsletter is once a week and it's like 2000 words or something. It's long. Mm-hmm. So for you and me, that's kind of our generation. We like that stuff. Yeah. You know, I want to look at it. I want to see it. I want to break it down for the next generation. They're like, give it to me in 30 seconds or I, you know, I'm not going to pay attention to it. Right. And so my thought was, let's give it to them in 30 seconds and then let's draw them away from all the noise and nonsense that's on TikTok oh, into lot. something that could be useful and beneficial for them, but still entertaining. Mm-hmm. And then last thing is I'm on like a mission to create more owners and by owners, it doesn't mean that they can't be employees. It just means that they've got to have skin in the game. And that's what we talk about. You can own a part of the business that you work for. And we should explain all these billionaires that do that. And you can own sort of the business line that you work for mm-hmm. by having incentive aligned comp. Like if I bring in this, I make this. Right. And so that's what we kind of start getting people to think more like. It's almost like financial education, but in a way that <clears throat> I feel like people who young people don't really have the attention span let's be honest so you have to like meet them where they're at exactly and it's chewable and it's bite-sized and of course you make it so entertaining oh thanks i mean (laughs) you're (laughs) you are a mood yeah that's true yeah we got a little bit of a personality (laughs) you are a mood i love it uh and so so what has this experience taught you about yourself Mm. now that you're really owning everything that you are and that you talk about. Well, one, it's like, God, why didn't we start this all? Like, what could, where would we be at? And like, you don't want to look backwards, but if we had started all these years ago, right. And it's like, you know, if there's any part of you that feels you should be doing X instead of Y, Mm. I'm like, oh my gosh, do it right now because Mm. I'm more successful. I've like done more deals. I've made more money. I have more fun than I ever did in finance. And yet I thought I had to be in finance to do all this stuff. And there are some people who are probably overhearing content that maybe really should be in finance and they're doing this because they feel like they have to. And so wherever you are, it's like, do the thing that you really are interested in doing Mm. because there's so many ways to make money. I mean, there's this guy, Wayne Hazinga, which I talk about a lot. Okay. He's the founder of waste management. Okay. Super sexy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. (laughs) Trash cans. Yeah trash business. The man turned this business into a business worth more than $30 billion, oh my God. starting from buying one old trash, uh, you know, truck and then growing and scaling from there. Mm. And then he did blockbuster by one gross little, uh, video store that he turned around and bought a bunch more. And then, and now he does like all of this fun stuff. So if you are interested in, I don't know, colored water. Like you could make billions. There's so many ways to do it. Mm. And yet we think there are these doctor, lawyer, attorney, finance, engineer, and yeah. that's not true. Paths. Yeah. Mm-hmm. At all. So because it's almost like you're democratizing the way that we would traditionally do business and even mm. invest, mm. Yeah. making it more accessible to pretty much anybody at whatever age. I feel like there was one TikTok um, or video that I saw that you were you were talking about how somebody makes money off of TikTok and YouTube yeah. just by you know sharing their their information. So, um, can you explain the risk? And I know you like to say low risk. What is the difference between high risk and low uh, low risk businesses? Yeah. Well, so um, I think a lot of people think that they maybe have to do what you and I did, which is like burn the bridges, get the divorce, get rid of everything. Ah, yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Start like, from fire, fire, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and I get that feeling. But um, first of all, if you have a small business whatsoever, everything that you do that has revenue that comes in mm-hmm. or money into your pocket can be sold. Mm-hmm. So one thing I'd say is say right now, like. We have a lovely videographer back here, cinematographer. What do we call these these days? Um, <laughs> producer. Producer. Ooh, even, okay, one level higher. He's adjusting his hat back there. So, um, <laughs> it, like, if his job was to be a video producer, mm-hmm. right, and he made, I don't know, I'm making up the numbers, $100,000 a year. And then he's like, you know what? I really actually want to go be in front of the camera. I don't want to do this business anymore. You should take that $100,000 job you have, mm-hmm. and you should sell it. And you should sell it for a hundred X or a hundred thousand dollars times two to three X, which is called the profit multiple. So if you're a teacher and you have a business that is tutoring people, you can sell your tutoring job to somebody else. Mm. And so when I say low risk businesses, what I mean is everything that we do is actually a business. It's like a U corp, but we think about it like a job and a U corp. Yeah. A U corp. Okay. So if you have a 1099, and you do something 
uh, where you get any sort of income, like I think you should think about selling that. So that's one way to get become an owner in a mm-hmm. way that most people Buy don't think business. about. Yeah. Exactly. And then the other low risk, you know, versus high risk business is a lot of people think in order to buy a business or invest in a business, you have to have millions. And that's not the case. So we teach all these other ways from like sweat equity, which is just putting your time into it to revenue share, which means I bring in a dollar, I get a portion of that dollar to get exposure to different investments without even having to put a dollar down. Mm. And so, um, so breaking away the traditional of like investing in stocks, for example. Oh yeah, exactly. Or having a portfolio with like a brokerage firm. Basically. Exactly. And there's nothing wrong with having that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I have stocks too. I just do not believe at all in day trading and I do not believe at all at all in the, the you're in my ability to beat the stock market. And what, you know, I got a PhD, I got an MBA, I worked at Goldman, I did all this stuff on wall street and I still don't think I can beat the stock market mm-hmm. because it's a little bit of, in my opinion, a rigged game, except for people at the very top. Sure. So why play a rigged game when you can do it in private entities? Like what I'm talking about so much easier. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. And how does one get started if they are kind of like navigating, okay, I kind of don't want to be in my like full-time job, or maybe I'm like, I, I want to venture out into doing things. We talk a lot about following your Dharma yeah. and, but I feel like what you're really getting at is teaching people how to be more financially savvy so that they can have more freedom in their lives, right? Totally. Okay. So let's take the follow your Dharma thing. Yeah. So let's say, give me like four Dharma Institute people. That's what it's called, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, what's like one thing that you hear a lot of people that they want to go do? So they are helping others follow their purpose. Okay. So they want to run a consulting, coaching, a coaching group. enterprise, enterprise. Yeah. Good, good word. And I think it's really important. The words you use. Yes. Like you not saying a group or I want to go be a coach, but saying I'm going to run a company, an enterprise, a business. One of my, I think our mutual friend, Noah Kagan, mm-hmm. he, uh, he told me when I started this, I called it my little blog mm. and he was like, don't do that. Mm. He's like, don't, do, don't, dim- yeah, diminish he's like, your don't, light. Yeah. yeah. And he's don't like, play this, small. <laughs> yeah, he's this very non touchy feely guy. Like talk about spreadsheets <laughs> and he runs okay dork. And he was like, it's a company you are running a media company. So anyway, I think that's important. Right. Um, but so say somebody wanted to go run a coaching business. What's amazing about you guys is you've built a bunch of these businesses. And so you know how to do all the operations to scale them, right? Sure. Yeah. I would insert a step before that, which would be Go and find somebody who already has a coaching business Mm -hmm. or go and find somebody who has a website that has a ton of customers or views that come to them. Anything that has profits in it already Mm -hmm. or eyeballs in it already. And before you just go do your startup of starting your new Dharma business, Mm -hmm. buy this other thing that means day one, you will have cash flow. Yeah. Because it's really scary to leave your job for a startup of hopes and dreams. So true. But if instead you can buy a business, and this is where people go, Cody, I don't have millions. And I go, it's okay. You don't need millions because there are all these ways to do something called seller financing, which means like Nita has a business that's worth $100,000, right? Mm -hmm. And $100,000 in profit. And I'm like, I wanna buy your business. Could I pay you $200,000 for your business, but I'll give it to you over the course of three years. Yeah which means that I still make money every single year from your profits, but you, but I pay you like stair stepped, you know? Yep. Yep. And so that's what we talk about. Oh my gosh. And you go through like teaching people how to actually do that. Exactly. Because I feel like people don't really know. And then they feel like they have to start from zero. They have to start from scratch. I mean, I remember, yeah, I didn't start my dental practice from scratch. I actually purchased one from a doctor who was retiring. I didn't know that. Yeah. And so it was already, you know, it was doing mid six figures. And I just bumped it up to seven, you yeah. know, in the first year. So it was, and then of course ran it, but. And how did you buy it? Did you use seller financing? Did you no, buy it outright cash? Did no, you take a loan? No, we took a loan. Yeah. yeah I took a loan. Uh, and how'd you get the loan? I mean, so with dental or medical based businesses, they're very keen on giving yeah. students or a loan. I wasn't a student at yeah. the time. I, I was actually graduated, but a loan because they knew that the cash flow was coming in. Exactly. There were a lot of patients already. It was an established business for about four. He was 40 years, actually. Yeah, the doctor, I mean, before me was like uh, 70s. And then a younger guy was like running it, but he wasn't really there. Totally. So he just had it as one of his practices and he wanted to offload. And I was like, all right, sign me up. You know, it was in a really nice blue collar you know, kind of upper scale neighborhood. Yeah. Um, and that's how it, that's how it all started. But yeah. 
I yeah. mean, we, 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 we get it. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I think when people look at you, they might like, they might get distracted by the fact that you're saying things like follow your Dharma and you know, that you have this focus on mindset and not realize that like all of that is on top of a foundation that is like finance thoughtful, you know, mm -hmm. like, yeah, every industry usually has somebody that can give you a loan for a profitable business. Almost every industry. Every I haven't single found industry. One. Yeah. I haven't yeah. found one that doesn't. And so, you know, apply this idea of being, of following your purpose, of following your why in a way that doesn't make you a starving artist. Smart. You know, it's not necessary. It's not necessary. And in fact, it doesn't serve your dharma. Because right. then you're just playing small. And how many people are you going to help? Right. Oh, you know? uh, we, we got to get you on, on the DCI <laughs> channel <laughs> to teach that. But I love that. I yeah. love, I love it. Uh, because people can really learn from you about what we should really have been taught in, in school about yeah. finance and breaking it down and that, you know, it, it doesn't have to be the 1% at the top of the top of the top. So oh, no. I love how you're disrupting that. And I love how you're kind of making it so accessible. So girl, Power. Um, so we're gonna switch gears and getting into a segment that I call "This Might Get a Little Ugly" or <laughs> <laughs> brave. Um, <laughs> so we'll start with describe a moment of a magical moment that sucked. Oof. Yeah, there's been a lot. I mean, uh, the one that popped in my head sort of immediately was um, I. So I think we all have patterns that we repeat a lot negative patterns. Mm. And, um, and mine has been that I pick really poor partnerships. Ooh, okay. Um, like and to love relationships or all of them. Give me all the bad <laughs> partnerships. I just want them. love business uh, friendships. too. Oh, that's a good one. No, not okay. friendships. Okay. I've had really long-term stable friendships and I think okay. I've only had really ever one go sideways, but that was a business partnership. So it yeah. was something about business and then obviously the, the marriage. And mm. so, um, I realized that after I got divorced, that the, the company I was with at the time, I started, uh, I was becoming kind of successful mm -hmm. and we were building this multi-billion dollar business. You know, I come from nothing. I didn't even know what a mutual fund was when I was younger. So like this was cool. And there were some articles getting written about it. And you it. grew up in Texas, right? I grew up in Arizona. Oh yeah. Yeah. Chris right. grew up in Texas, okay. my husband. Okay. Um, and so, um, all this stuff was, was sort of happening that got a couple articles written on me, but I partnered with a firm that I was at at the time mm -hmm. where the CEO, uh, and some of the senior managers didn't like that. Mm. I was starting to get some of this focus and attention. It's notoriety. Right. Yeah. And I, you know, wasn't thinking about it from a, you know, 48 laws of power, you know, um, perspective where Machiavellian perspectives would say, never supersede the master, mm. right? Which is something that happens when you're in a corporation. You gotta be really careful about superseding the manager, the leader, the CEO, right? Whatever. The ego comes up. Exactly. Mm. And if you're gonna do it, you gotta be really thoughtful on how. And so I was like, look at all this press we're getting. It's so great. We're making all this money. We're going this big business. This is awesome. And I would share it with them and I'd be excited just like I would be excited if they shared it with me. And what essentially happened is I got, I got pushed out. And mm. so, you know, he, he, the CEO took me on this long walk I was kind of like, who do you think you are? Mm. And, and then he said something to me. Were you the only female in the firm? I was the only, uh, yeah, I was the only senior manager at the firm. Well, and I owned the Latin American division. So I guess it was probably the only partner. I think maybe the head of HR was a woman too. Oh gosh. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's exactly what you think. And this was, these guys made Wolf on Wall Street look tame. I oh, mean, wow. they were wild, wild. Cutthroat. Oh, like cutthroat just... and partying and drugs and all this stuff that I really am not into. Mm. And, um, and so anyway, so he took me on this walk and kind of told me like, you're going to have to pick, like, do you want, does it matter to you that your face is on this or that, you know, you need to either be quiet and keep doing what you're doing. Or, um, you got to find something else because like, there's not enough room for you at the top kind of here. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. I know. And I remember like just going home and bawling like, oh my God, I built this thing for this person. And now like you built it with them right. and kind of for them. Yeah. I mean, they didn't speak Spanish going down in Latin America and building up a multi-billion dollar business. They had no idea what they were doing. It went from zero dollars to huge dollars. And, um, so it was super painful for me. And I had a lot of my identity wrapped in it. Cause that was right post divorce too, that this was all happening. And, um, but in that moment I realized, why do I think that I have to have these and excuse me, cause I'm married to a lovely white man, but <laughs> I was like, why do I have to have these middle-aged white guys the like, yeah, that allow mm -hmm. me to think that I can go build something. I don't need these fucking guys. 
And then what did I do? I went and partnered with another one <laughs> at another firm and built up another big business. And what happened? Same thing. Came crashing down. Literally. They were like, you're too, you know, I'm the founder. You're not. Why are you the face of this so much? So they were so threatened by your brilliance, by, by you. Yeah. I mean, I hate to put assumptions on them, but like they didn't like it for whatever reason, you know, and, and, and powerful female. Yeah. And opinionated. You'll, if you read the newsletter, you'll see that, but you know, why She's did a mood, I, you guys, I'm yeah, telling you. why did I think Which I needed great. them? Yeah. And so that's when I realized you've got to do something by yourself and you've got to dig into this belief that you have somewhere that you can't do it by yourself. Why don't you think Cody's capable? Why do you tell these other people that they're capable? And then you don't think Cody is capable of doing what, it. What came up for you when you were asking yourself that question? Um, well, it was a lot of, uh, it was a lot of like looking in the mirror, like, you're right. Like, do I have a bad opinion of myself? You know what? Like, why do I think these need, I need these guys. I tell everybody, I do all this scary stuff. I build these big things, but at the end of the day, you know, if it's just you versus you in the mirror, you're not living what you're telling other people. So that's kind of hypocritical. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what pushed me over the edge finally to be like, okay, you know, I got to go take the risk. Mm -hmm. And what got me over it is at the end of the day, especially for us here in the U S for most of us, people listening to this, like, you can't fail that big. Like, I'm not going to go be destitute, unable to eat. You know, I have friends whose couches I can sleep on. I can do some other skills. So like, where is this fear really coming from? And it's just that I didn't want people to see me fail publicly. Mm. You know, I could blame it on other people if I partnered with somebody else. Right. But if it's just me, who am I going to blame it on? And so I finally took that on and everything opened up after Oof. that. You know, the FUD gates opened yeah. massively and look at where you are. <laughs> I love that. Um, well, I wanted to kind of get into uh, switch gears again. And as we kind of wrap up this incredibly juicy conversation, what is a practice or ritual or book or product that is elevating your life in a big way right now? Mm -hmm. um, probably the biggest thing I've done of late is, um, well, I, I'm not really drinking anymore. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, that's huge. I know. So huge. yeah, I started doing the hard 75, like Andy Frisella's program, which okay. is basically like is. 75 days. You work out twice a day, which is like a huge time commitment. One could be a walk. So it's not like I'm, you know, going crazy, but okay. two a days, uh, gallon of water, 10 pages of a book. Um, you take a progress picture of yourself to kind of see how you progress. You follow a diet, whatever that is for you, or just like healthy eating. You can pick your poison. Sure. And um, so anyway, so I've been doing that for a period and I just realized I'm so much, I'm so much more clear from it. So decrease, and I'm not saying it's for everybody, but decreasing the drinking for me, mm -hmm. even just a glass or two of wine yeah. has really changed the game. And then, uh, and then I think the other thing is, you know, I've been pretty relentless and I think you did the same thing about I want to focus on this one thing. I'm saying no to everything else mm -hmm. until I get whatever is inside of me out for this period. Yeah. And then I will go do the other stuff, but I don't have FOMO anymore. I'm like, this is the thing people who will either get it or, so good. or they won't get it. Yeah. And that's not on me. You're so good. Yeah. No. You're so good at that. I try lately. I mean, that's huge. So what Cody does it mean to be brave? Hmm. I mean, at the core of it, I think you can't be brave without fear, right? So it means you're scared and you do it anyway. And brave for me, I think is also like when you look in the mirror, you know, cause that's all that really matters at the end of the day are the things that you say, the things that you do. And I'll give an, an example. Um, we go to a gym here mm. and, um, at the gym, there are a lot of people that are like us. We're on the interwebs and maybe we have some following or not. Right. And a lot of people have moved to Austin. Yes. A lot of, yes. <laughs> and, yeah. and a lot of, uh, what I see them post on the line is not who they are in person. Ooh. So like online, they're super nice and amazing. And here's these things. And then you go in the gym and they're like, Hey, you're in my shot. Can you get out? I'm like filming content here. And you're like, and then they might realize who you are. And so then they're like, Oh, anyway, Cody, what's uh, going on? Like, you want to be on the podcast next week? And so, and I don't, I don't judge them for that. Cause I think we've all yeah. been there, right? but I think your ego gets so much grosser when you're public and you're a persona oh, and then yeah. you're private and it doesn't match the two right. that like, and so be brave. And then like, whatever you post on the internet, make sure it's you. Cause mm. I think increasingly these days, those two things are not related. And if you think people don't notice you're they wrong. Do. Oh, yeah. they do. 
And it, it, I'm talking to me, I'm talking to you. Like all of us have moments where it's maybe not totally us. Right. But that's real bravery to me. It's like, be whoever Show you up. are all the fucking time with the janitor, with the CEO, with everybody, mm. you know? I love that. And you do that so well. Yeah, you know, you try. Uh, but I also think I have some love for people that struggle with that because think like how many days am I out and maybe, and I'm not a big deal at all, but like, let's imagine that we were famous and that then somebody, you know, says something to you, but you just got in a fight and like your little one has a fever. And so you're like, fuck, I don't, you know, I don't have time for this. And I go do this other right. thing. Right. You know? Um, and so I get that, but I try to just, Hey, if I'm going to say that I'm a nice human who cares about other people on the internet, I better be that. I'm going to act that way. Mm-hmm. And it's, it's a, it's a blessing and an honor that we get to do this. Like, we do this for a little, this is ridiculous. I know, right? right? I mean, we're, we're so filming. Like, What's happening? This, this is, is my job. My dream what? come true when I was like yeah. seven years old and we right. had it like Mr. Jones's class and like you had to pretend like you were having like an Oprah kind of a talk show and here we are. Exactly. And I the table. Yeah, I you mean, match the, I'm really, I match, what's, what's I going match on? the wallpaper, yeah. guys. Dreams come true. You made it. You made it. <laughs> yes, exactly. One word that describes the season of your life? Oh, um, flow. That's my word this year. Stop fighting it. Start flowing with it. Oh, so good. And where can we get more juiciness from Cody? Uh, I think the best spot is contrarianthinking.co. That's our newsletter. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then... Such I'm, a fabu- fabulous newsletter. Oh, thank I mean, you. really, really. We take it really seriously. Yeah. I don't put trash on there. No. Um, and then uh, Cody Sanchez on TikTok, Twitter, Instagram, yeah. all the things. you got to see her on TikTok. I mean, <laughs> half a million followers in like less than a year. It's just biz- bananas. Yeah. <laughs> Crazy. Yeah. you got to get after her TikTok. Because your mean, Instagram is so good. I know, but yeah. I know. It's, I know. it's, it's like too, another it's, thing. It's too much. Yeah. It's, yeah. But that's when you have to mama, remember. the baby. I know. It's just, it's too much. But anyways, yeah. <laughs> in the meantime, they can yeah. follow you. <laughs> deal. 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 All right. And until next time on The Brave Table. See you next time at the Brave Table.